Good afternoon. It's very nice to see all of you and I'm very pleased that so many of you have turned up and we have got a very mixed audience I notice. Some older people and some younger people and that's exactly what we like to see. I would like to welcome you to yet another great talk in the context of our lecture series the United States and World Affairs, the Cold War and beyond. I'm Klaus Laris and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I'm very happy to observe that once again it is very nice and sunny in Chapel Hill. <laughs> I would like to thank the many generous sponsors for supporting this exciting lecture series. As always, if you would like to become a sponsor yourself, then please don't hesitate to let me know. I won't turn you away. All our talks and lectures are available, are available for free on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our channel and watch as many of the talks as you possibly can. They're all really good. All of us are aware of the major crisis which has recently erupted in, in Ukraine and in Crimea. Russian political and military activities in these parts of the world remind us of the tension during the Cold War in Eastern Europe. Are we observing the outbreak of a new Cold War right now? I don't know. It is difficult to say. Perhaps the 2008 war between Russia and Georgia makes a better comparison than, let's say, the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956 or of Czechoslovakia in 1968. In any case, we are very fortunate today. We have an expert here who will enlighten us about the Cold War in Eastern Europe. In particular, our speaker will talk about the end of the Cold War in 1989. It is a great pleasure to welcome to Chapel Hill Günther Bischoff of the University of New Orleans. Günther is a native of Austria, so he has been working and living in the United States for quite some time, I believe. He obtained degrees from the University of Innsbruck in Austria and the University of New Orleans and he did his PhD at Harvard in 1989 under the supervision of Ernest May. At present, Günther Bischoff is a university research professor and the Marshall Plan professor and director of the Center Austria at the University of New Orleans. He also was a visiting professor at a great number of universities, such as Innsbruck in Austria, Salzburg, Vienna, the Liberal Arts University in Moscow, and the Economics Universities in Vienna and Prague. Günther Bischoff is a prolific scholar. He is the author of Austria and the First Cold War, 1945 to 1955, and of a book on Austria and the United States in the 20th century, which has just come out. He also is co-editor of the long-running series Contemporary Austrian Studies, and so far 22 volumes have been published. And he also edits the series Transatlantica, and another seven volumes have been published in this series. <coughs> He has also edited and co-edited another 20 books on topics such as the Cold War in Central Europe and the Second World War. Most recently, a massive volume has come out entitled The Vienna Summit of 1961 and its importance in international history. As you will have guessed, Günther Bischoff has great expertise on the Second World War, the Cold War and the Austrian question in all its many complex dimensions. Today, Günther Bischoff uh, we'll talk about George H. W. Bush and the end of the Cold War in Eastern Europe, the acceleration of history in 1989. I would like to encourage you to ask lots of questions after his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great uh, pleasure and honor to present to you today Professor Günther Bischoff. Thank you very much, Professor La Lares, for, those, uh, for that very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here among so many distinguished historians that I see in the audience, uh, uh, fine uh, University of North Carolina graduate students. Uh, and uh, from a New Orleans perspective, happy Mardi Gras. Yeah. <laughs> I managed to escape Rex this morning with my wife who drove up with me and we drove straight into a North Carolina ice storm. <laughs> So uh, my Austrian memories were coming, coming alive again there. Uh, the topic today is the end of the Cold War in Eastern Europe, and particularly how the Bush administration uh, developed its Eastern European policies in 1989. Uh, I'm going to give you a power prime presentation and will not read from a manuscript, but uh, since my topic is the acceleration of history, I thought I'd start out just with a couple of quotations that sort of give you a sense for that topic. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, 
caught this heightened pace of history unfolding in his diary, November 1989. Quote, the pace of developments in Eastern Europe continues to astonish. So many things have happened in the last year, last month, last week, that I never expected to happen in my lifetime. The collapse of the Berlin Wall is followed by the upheaval in Bulgaria, now by the incipient rescue of Czechoslovakia. How right I have been to argue the inscrutability of history. Once again, events defy our expectations and history outwits all our certitudes." Unquote. Nice uh, ending there. History outwits all our certitude. Brent Cocroft, the national security advisor in the Bush administration, fretted that after the entirely unanticipated collapse of the Berlin Wall and progressing implosion of the Iron Curtain, the excitement in the White House was, quote, tempered by the reality of domestic Soviet politics, for we could not be certain how long the window of opportunity would remain open. And he added, we believe that the Soviets would be anxious to keep improving relations, for foreign policy failures would only worsen Gorbachev's political troubles at home. The Bush White House felt, uh, uh, says Kofroft, we had to move quickly, and here we come to the theme, and carefully to make the most of the favorable climate before Gorbachev left, or was forced from the scene. We sensed we were running against a clock, but we did not know how much time was left. So here is the theme. We sensed we were running against a clock. We did not know how much time was left. What was actually happening in 1989, particularly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that history was accelerating so quickly, and that was a perception, uh, uh, was accelerating so quickly that the Bush administration had a very hard time to really formulate responses to it. So. What I plan to do this afternoon is uh, give you a quick introduction into Reagan's foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the new Gorbachev administration. And uh, again, the thesis here is this uh, accelerating pace of history uh, that the Bush administration had to respond to. And also the trouble with the Republican right wing that was constantly staring over his shoulders. And then the transition from Reagan to, uh, Reagan to Bush uh, then uh, I will talk about the strategic review of the Bush administration in the spring of 1989. And then finally, uh, in a series of speeches, uh, the new policy being revealed to the public in April and May. And then a very frantic traveling activity uh, by uh, President Bush, uh, uh, two trips to Europe, uh, uh, in which he sort of got a sense about this accelerated pace of history. And then finally, his decision as a result of those trips uh, to uh, hold a summit with uh, Gorbachev. Uh, and I will end then with the Malta uh, summit. <clears throat> so let's go into it. With the Reagan administration, uh, of course, the interesting thing is that the first and the second term greatly differed from each other. The first term was full of the evil empire rhetoric and, uh, as many scholars would argue, a new Cold War. Uh, uh, and the second, uh, uh, the second uh, term uh, was much more than a response to Gorbachev's uh, uh, new thinking that was announced in 1985 and then in a series of summits, the beginning dialogue with the Soviet Union. Now, <clears throat> I think if you'd want to look for why there was such a big difference uh, in uh, the two Reagan terms. One of the explanations would be that there was two very different uh, Soviet NSC advisor in each of the terms. In the first term, there was a hardliner, very anti-Soviet Richard Pipes, a Harvard professor of Russian history, uh, uh, who then left, I think, in 1983 because he didn't want to give up his Harvard tenure. And in the second term, uh, Jack Matlock, a very experienced Soviet expert and diplomat, came in. He was taken out of the embassy in Prague and was brought to Washington. And I think uh, Bush, uh, Reagan's careful second term policy had a lot uh, uh, to do with uh, Matlock's advice. So uh, the new policy was first revealed in a speech in early January of 1984. So this was towards the end of the second term before the election. And this speech was very much drafted by Matlock. 
And the new agenda sort of uh, uh, was being announced to the public that uh, what the future dialogue would be about would be about eliminating regional conflicts, would be pushing for nuclear disarmament, and this became a very important subject matter with uh, Reagan. Overall, establishing a better working relationship uh, with the Soviet Union, and finally to push the Kremlin on human rights, which of course was an issue that came out of the Helsinki Final Act and the CSC agenda. Uh, so, <clears throat> the problem uh, for Reagan when he wanted to uh, unfold this new foreign policy was that the Soviet leaders kept dying on him. As you know, Brezhnev died in 1982, in came Andropov, and uh, barely two years later he passed away. Uh, in came Chernenko, barely a year later he came, uh, he passed away, and then finally uh, the Politburo saw the handwriting on the wall and elected a younger man to become the chief of the party, which of course was Mikhail Gorbachev, who then unfolded his dramatic policies of new thinking, Glasnost and Perestroika. <coughs> Uh, and uh, it is important to note here, and, and I think Jack Matlock had a lot to do with this too, that uh, uh, Bush uh, began to play a considerable role in uh, Reagan's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe because he happened to go to all the funerals. So he showed up in Moscow year after year for yet another funeral and of course in the process got to know uh, uh, the new uh, leadership too, including, including Gorbachev. Uh, and what then happened uh, 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 in the later term of the second uh, Reagan presidency was a series of summit. This four-point agenda was finally being tested and the dialogue was started with Gorbachev. And uh, you know, if you just look a bit at the visual record, the two of them uh, developed a very close relationship. I think at times you could even say intimate relationship. And uh, that was developed as a result of these frequent meetings in the various summits. Uh, uh, you know Geneva, Reykjavik in 86, the almost dramatic breakthrough in uh, a nuclear disarmament. It did not happen because of Star Wars. And then INF was signed in Washington in 87, a visit in Moscow 88, and finally the summit at Governor's Island. I'll come back to that. The summit at Governor, Gov Governor's Island was sort of a transition summit. It had had a lot to do with the speech uh, that Gorbachev gave in early December at the United Nations. And I would argue that's one of the most important speeches uh, that Gorbachev gave in, in, in his in, uh, entire administration because in this speech he made dramatic announcements that essentially uh, implicitly argued the end of the Brezhnev doctrine and some people would even say the potential end of the Cold War. He announced a unilateral disarmament in Eastern Europe of 500,000 troops, of 5,000 tanks, uh, uh, and made a number of other dramatic uh, announcements. And when the day later they met at Governor's Island uh, in uh, the harbor of New York, uh, Gorbachev was very keen to hear what uh, Reagan was thinking about his speech. Uh, Reagan said, pretty interesting, but it sounded like Reagan had sort of already tuned out. Uh, Bush, on the other hand, uh, was not really willing uh, to talk any detail yet with uh, Gorbachev. He said he was uh, planning a big review of his foreign policies and the way scholars look at this now is Bush wanted to take time to step out of the shadow uh, of Reagan. He wanted to develop his own foreign policy so he didn't really want to give away the candy store. Now let's talk a bit about the Bush administration and the principal people who were involved in formulating Bush's foreign policy. And uh, by going to the Bush Library and looking at the National Security Council files, I have to say I developed an entirely new view of the Bush administration in the sense that I came in with a sort of jaundiced uh, approach, but then very quickly realized that the national security team that Bush had assembled was superb. Uh, there, of course, was uh, Brent Cocroft as NSC advisor, who was an old hand and had, had the same uh, position already under President Ford. James Baker was an old Washington hand as Secretary of State. But then particularly the NSC staffers were a group of very impressive people. Uh, Robert Hutchins, Robert Blackwell, sort of the head of European affairs. But then particularly two young people who were specialists on the NSC staff, Condoleezza Rice for Soviet affairs, Philip Selico for German affairs, and sort of in a 
a really unique moment of writing contemporary history. The two of them penned a book, which I think is still the best book written on these events, Germany Unified and Europe Transformed. And essentially, they got access to NSC files, which 20 years later, as a historian, I haven't gotten access to yet. That, of course, that special uh, uh, access made the, the book uh, uh, such a powerful book. Now, the strategic review then would unfold in the spring of 1989. Uh, this became non, known as the pause in Russian pausa, uh, sort of uh, used as a disparaging term, very often as a critical term, because essentially uh, the uh, this Cocroft dream was reassessing the entire uh, European and Soviet policy of the Bush administration. Uh, there was a National Security Council document that was written by uh, early April 19. 89, it was not really uh, made public before September, but in this document for the first time, a very important uh, uh, figure of speech, if you will, uh, uh, emerged, uh, namely that they wanted to develop a policy beyond containment. So this beyond containment became sort of a key phrase of the new Bush approach to Eastern Europe. The policies were then uh, uh, announced in the public in four major speeches that the president gave. One in Hamtrank, Michigan uh, in mid-April. And in the Hamtrank speech, this was a, a, a suburb of Detroit with a heavy Polish population. He talked about uh, uh, his policies vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe. Uh, he encouraged uh, the reforms that were going on. This was the time when the Polish roundtable was being formed, uh, when solidarity was admitted into the roundtable. So there, the speeding up of history was already occurring as Bush talked about it. Uh, and uh, also, uh, he was beginning to talk about potential economic aid that would be given to Poland. And this is one of those instances where you are very much reminded of what's unfolding in Ukraine now, because one of the major problems of the <laughs> Ukraine today is that they are totally indebted uh, and that they need uh, very quickly injections in order to keep on with their policies or whatever their reform process will entail. And that was exactly the situation that Bush encountered in Poland, about 30 uh, billion in the red at the time, uh, and the constant call for uh, economic aid. So he was beginning to talk about that too. Interesting, in the NSC files in the Bush library is the fact that there really is a Polish lobby in this country. And that Polish lobby was very active uh, in the spring of 1989, constantly bombarding the White House with letters, constantly demanding a more positive policy towards Eastern Europe, Europe and at the same time uh, also uh, reminding Bush that uh, uh, foreign aid, uh, economic, uh, economic help was, was needed in Poland. Uh, and the key phrase uh, that was uh, uttered in this speech by Bush was that let the European, Eastern Europeans choose their system of government. Essentially, he, was, uh, 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 he, he wanted to see self-determination for Eastern Europe. I think that's what he, he meant by that. He then gave a couple commencement spe speeches, one at Texas A&M on May 12th. Uh, and here he first, for the first time, used this phrase in public that he wanted to develop a policy beyond containment in dealing with the events in Eastern Europe. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later at Boston University, also a commencement speech, he was up on the platform uh, with uh, François Mitterrand. Both of them received essentially uh, honorary degrees from Boston University. And here uh, he specifically was talking about the events in Western Europe, Western European integration, the U.S. support of these policies going back to the Marshall Plan, uh, and that Western Europe should be a magnet for Eastern Europeans. And then he went on his first uh, trip uh, overseas uh, to a NATO summit, 40th anniversary of NATO in Brussels, and uh, he took a quick trip over to Germany from Brussels and gave a speech in Mainz, the old uh, 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 Rhine metropolis, and here he began to talk about uh, Germany. He called for self-determination for the Germans too, let Berlin be next, he said there specifically, and there are some speech drafts who already recommended that he use the word reunification. But Bush being so careful in this entire policy process, I think that would be my point, shows how cautiously he approached these matters. How he did not want to uh, upset the apple, apple cart for uh, 
Gorbachev, in spite of the pressure from the Republican right, I can talk about that later, I won't go into that right now, uh, and then sort of the key phrase again, there cannot be a common European home until all within it are free to move from room to room. Because the common European home is a phrase that uh, Gorbachev very often used in his speeches. And if you recall, Gorbachev was a superstar in Western Europe at that time. He was visiting all of the Western European countries, including Germany, and there was a very wild welcome. Uh, welcomes that Bush didn't uh, really experience. So in that sense, very often in the public policy, if you will, uh, Gorbachev uh, 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 upstaged uh, the Western statesman. Uh, just a visual record again of uh, the meeting in Brussels uh, with the Western statesman. This is the first time when he uh, met Thatcher and of course Mitterrand he had met before and then the visit in Mainz where, where he met Kohl. And maybe I should mention at this time one of the amazing ways of communication that Bush, uh, and I think this might be quite unique to him, uh, a practice was frequent phone calls to all of the Western leaders. Now, a lot of phone calls to Gaulle, uh, to Kohl, a fewer ones to Gorbachev. Gorbachev calls started to pick up in the second half of 1989. And I think this was really his chief way of communicating with Western statesmen. And these calls, you can, uh, were all taped. Uh, you can see the transcripts, and I think they are even online in the Bush Library. So for the students in here, if you're looking for good paper topics, uh, uh, there would be a lot of theses to be written just uh, out of uh, 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 those phone calls and the communications that went on at the time. Now, <clears throat> then came a very dramatic trip uh, to Eastern Europe, to Poland and to Hungary. And uh, this is the time when the round table in Poland was sort of uh, culminating, coming to the conclusion that an election would be held. A few weeks later, after this, an election was held. The communists were practically voted out of office. And Bush actually was mediating at the time that they should not let go of Jaroszelski entirely, but rather hold on to Jaroszelski as president if a non-communist uh, would become prime minister, which of course was Matsoviecki, who a few uh, weeks later would uh, uh, enter the office of prime minister. Uh, so there was behind the scenes politicking going on there. But of course, again, the public uh, 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 the public uh, uh, appearances by Bush uh, with Valenza in Gdansk, uh, at the Sejm in Poland, with hu huge crowds uh, in, in uh, Warsaw, spoke its own language. Now, what the Poles had expected was an announcement of a ton of foreign aid. And the public policy person, Nancy Dyke on the National Security Council, in fact had written a memo before he left and said, Let's not uh, make this uh, a trip where major expectations would come out of it in terms of uh, American aid. Let not, and she used this phrase, let them not expect a Marshall Plan from the United States. And that's very much how Bush came uh, to Poland. He brought $100 million in economic aid. The Poles had expected something like $10 billion over three years. So from the Polish perspective, it was a letdown that they didn't get the kind of aid package that uh, they were hoping for. And if you then add up the aid that was flowing for the rest of the year from the United States to Poland, it was about a billion dollars. The Germans in uh, loan guarantees and such gave them more money. So that was somewhat disappointing. And I would think what Kerry was doing today in Kiev was being in very much in similar conversations with uh, Ukrainian leaders about the kind of aid expectations they were having. If you recall, we've heard numbers, $50 billion needed, thrown, away, uh, thrown around. And probably Kerry giving them a reality check, I think he announced today a, a billion dollars which is a more than a million dollars, so that might sort of reflect the inflation rate of the dollar in terms of aid promises being made. But, but uh, I would expect that there were similar conversations going on that Bush was having in, in, uh, in, in, in Warsaw at the time, and there's these oversized expectations uh, that people uh, had uh, uh, of the Bush administration that he could not meet because the country had its own economic difficulties. He then went on to Hungary, 
Uh, and uh, Hungary is an interesting case too because what was not discussed, but what was the background going on at this time was that in fact on the Austro-Hungarian border, in these days the Iron Curtain was being cut down. The first opening happened in May, before the trip, and then this famous picture of the two foreign ministers, Mokan, the Hungarian foreign minister, uh, happened on June 17th. Uh, and of course, it was uh, that famous uh, photo op that was staged uh, for the international press uh, that gave the East Germans then ideas. And of course, in the next few weeks, this would be the major breach in the Iron Curtain that eventually brought the entire Iron Curtain down. But interestingly enough, in the Bush record, I did not really find a lot of references to this major event going on. Uh, but he did visit Pol uh, uh, Hungary. Hungary was involved in, in the same process as the Poles in, a, in a, a round table, also with very dramatic results, elections uh, are coming out. And in all, on all of these occasions, uh, Bush was very uh, uh, sedate in his rhetoric, I would argue. If you look at these speeches, uh, uh, there was, uh, again, uh, a very strong feeling, uh, I must not uh, really uh, sort of uh, force the agenda, but rather let it unfold uh, on its own terms, which I think in the uh, long run and looking back uh, was, was the right strategy. There was then also a visit uh, in Paris on July 12th, they celebrated the 200th anniversary of uh, uh, the French Revolution. Uh, Bush was there too, and uh, it must have struck him while they were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, he was witnessing in Poland and in Hungary <coughs> revolutions unfolding. And there is another back story to this. Namely, Tiananmen Square. That happened early June of 1989. And you could say what was unfolding in Eastern Europe was sort of the opposite of Tiananmen Square. There was no bloody cutting down of the revolutions. And I think Bush's careful treading uh, and uh, careful encouragement probably had something to do with that. Uh, but of course, when you saw the extraordinary events on Maidan Square in Kiev uh, in the past couple of weeks, particularly during uh, the Sochi Olympics, you know, uh, I was sort of reminded of Tiananmen. That could have been another Tiananmen and it almost happened and didn't happen. It yet might happen, but I think the policymakers at the time, of course, always had to think this is what we have to prevent from happening in Eastern Europe future uh, uh, bloody uh, crackdowns like uh, they had experienced in, in Tiananmen. So you could say that was sort of a bad part of the agenda of events that were not happening. Now on the trick back, uh, as Cocroft and Bush began to talk about the, these dramatic events, realizing having been on the spot, witnessing uh, what the roundtables were, were accomplishing in these two countries, and they then made the spontaneous uh, decision it's time for a summit meeting. Now Jack Matlock had come back from Moscow in March already and pleaded for a summit. But at that time, Cocroft was uh, against the summit because he said a summit meeting so early in the presidency might really uh, uh, have uh, great, uh, produce great expectations in the public of too many things coming out of a summit. So he advised against it. And it was very interesting that the same thing happened in March of 1961 uh, when there was a lot of push for a summit between Kennedy and Khrushchev. And then it was Dean Rusk who made exactly the same argument. It's too early. Let's not have a summit. Uh, the expectations in the public will be too great uh, for uh, progress being made. The summit did happen then in uh, uh, June in Vienna, 1961. And of course, you'd have to say it was a somewhat failed summit from uh, Kennedy's perspective. So maybe uh, 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 Matlock, uh, what, what I say, uh, Kokoff's caution there was a very shrewd one. So now they began to work on getting such a summit meeting to happen. Uh, Bush operated very quietly, sent a letter to Gorbachev through personal emissaries. Gorbachev liked the idea of a no agenda summit as they called it. So let's get, get together, let's meet each other personally, but let's not uh, have too big of an agenda uh, because it's too early for that. 
Now, <coughs> I've done a lot of work on symmetry, and it's always interesting how the sites are being chosen. The sites that were being discussed, that were being uh, uh, suggested by Bush, uh, were uh, either in Kennebunkport or uh, uh, Camp David or Alaska. So he wanted to have a US summit. Uh, Gorbachev did not like that idea. Uh, he would go on a trip to Italy in December and suggested a Mediterranean site. They were considering Spain. And then eventually they agreed on Malta because Bush's brother had just visited there. And sort of something, you know, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, uh, crazy as that, uh, then made, uh, uh, encouraged uh, uh, Bush uh, to hold the summit in Malta. And Malta was agreed as the summit site. And it only became public on October 30th. So imagine this, as the State Department people were beginning to prepare the briefing books, uh, if you've ever studied the summit, you will see that the president is being presented with very extensive briefing book, book on virtually every issue that you can imagine. Now, I haven't seen the Malta briefing books yet. They're in the State Department. Those files are not open yet. I've seen the Vienna briefing books, and they were four volumes. So there's a lot of study to be done by a president bef before he meets in Ayalta. That's that sort of, uh, uh, of, of summit preparation. But while this was being done, events began to unfold in Eastern Europe. The Berlin Wall came down on November 9th, and then the German question took on essentially a pace of its own. Bush already, excuse me, called a couple weeks after the coming down of the uh, Berlin Wall, uh, uh, announced uh, at the end of the month his 10-part agenda. And this 10-part agenda already envisioned uh, German Confederation, uh, which was sort of uh, a very diplomatic way of saying we are moving towards uh, unification. At the time, it was, was called, uh, uh, it was called uh, uh, a German Confederation. Uh, <coughs> Now, this was just the beginning of the crazy November of 1989, because, of course, after Germany, events, uh, the Velvet Revolution began to unfold uh, in uh, the streets of Prague, the extraordinary events uh, on Venceslav Square and uh, uh, Havel emerging, the old dissident as uh, the major new leader of Czechoslovakia. And you sort of, again, get from the visual uh, record uh, the extraordinary uh, power of people power in, in these events. Uh, you see it there in St. Venceslav Square. And then, of course, it began to spill over very quickly into other Eastern European countries. Uh, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and of course, only Romania would be a somewhat uh, bloodier revolution, uh, shades of Tiananmen. But all the other events unfolded uh, uh, quite peacefully. Now, <coughs> As uh, uh, the president was being prepared for Malta, uh, some of his State Department advisors uh, wrote a long memoranda on the German question because that obviously, given the events unfolding in the streets uh, of Berlin, would be one of the major issues that uh, uh, were to be raised in Malta. And it's interesting that in this memorandum, uh, the State Department people, the NSC people, were talking of what's going to happen in German is inter-German reassociation. So at this point in time, they were dancing around reunification as a term to be used. So they called it inter-German reassociation. And uh, this is sort of the language that, uh, that Bush took to Malta, even though there he didn't talk about reassociation. But he didn't talk about reunification either. So on. Uh, December 1st, the Bush team got to Malta. It would be a seaside summit. They would meet in ships like Roosevelt and Churchill had met uh, in Malta before they went on to Yalta in February of 1945. Uh, so the first uh, meeting on the morning of December 2nd was on a big Soviet cruise ship. There was a major winter storm unfolding during these days. That's why this summit is also sometimes called the Seasick Summit, because apparently uh, uh, on one of the transfers between uh, the USS Belknap, where the president and his team stayed, over to the uh, Soviet uh, cruise ship, James Baker spilled his cookies. So <laughs> uh, that's, that's uh, amongst other reasons why uh, 
uh, became known as the CSIC summit. But uh, <clears throat> if you look at how the Vienna summit unfolded and how this summit unfolded, uh, the, the atmosphere could not have been friendlier. There was none of the iciness that we had seen between Khrushchev uh, and, and uh, Kennedy. It was very warm. Bush started out with the presentation, sort of presenting what he thought they should be discussing, regional conflicts. Think of uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua going on in Central America. Uh, the Philippines was a regional conflict. Afghanistan uh, was coming to the end. A disarmament agenda, start and chemical weapons negotiations. Economic issues, suspending Jackson Vanek. Uh, uh, USSR wanted observer status in GATT. These were sort of the principal issues that Bush initially presented. And uh, Gorbachev very much welcomed uh, this uh, agenda. And then one interesting exchange took place uh, where uh, Bush was sort of calling for the end of the Brezhnev doctrine, and they were actually discussing that in the summit. Uh, and Gorbachev said, well, you are asking us for no further interventions. We have just pulled out of Afghanistan. You are the guys who are constantly intervening in Panama, in the Philippines. So he said, maybe we shouldn't speak of the Brezhnev doctrine, but of the Bush doctrine, American interventionism in various uh, third world crisis spots. Uh, so, and then finally they came to the major issue, German unification, where Gorbachev thought Kohl was pushing the agenda much too quickly, that German uh, unification was entirely premature. And Bush making, I think, a very characteristic statement. I have not danced on the Berlin Wall, he said to Gorbachev. And Gorbachev applauded that, but said, you cannot expect us not to approve of German unification. Given the alliance uh, we have with Germany, how could we not approve of uh, these matters going forward? So that's sort of how they left it. They didn't really, they only touched upon what of course very quickly would become the major issue uh, uh, in the German unification agenda. Where would Germany end up in terms of its security status? Would it be uh, united within NATO? Or would it be, as was discussed for a while, united within NATO? However, the East German, the Neue Bundesländer, the East German provinces uh, disarmed, meaning neutral. Uh, that was seriously discussed at this time. Still, of course, it wouldn't happen. Uh, uh, soon thereafter, the so-called 2 plus 4 formula would develop. Uh, uh, first uh, sort of accepted in Ottawa in late, uh, I think January of 1990 it was. I don't look at those events anymore. And then of course out of those two plus four uh, discussions would come German unification. And also uh, that uh, extraordinary decision in roughly March, only a couple months later, in fact a united Germany would end up in NATO. And I think that's one of the factors that Putin never has forgiven Gorbachev that who you would allow that to happen. Because of course that was the moment, I would think, from Putin thinking today, when uh, NATO then very quickly in the next years expanded towards Eastern Europe. And I think ultimately Putin is much more afraid of uh, 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 Ukraine becoming NATO than you, a NATO country one day than Ukraine becoming a member of the European Union. So I think those events uh, in a way foreshadow what has been happening and is still happening today. And I think I would also argue that is sort of part of the significance of study these events in detail because we see a lot of the things we are discussing today already foreshadowed uh, in these meetings. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you for attention and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Günther, for this very enlightening talk. We certainly know now an awful lot more about the events and procedures and developments in 1989. And thanks for drawing the line from the old Cold War to something uh, which we wouldn't like to call a new Cold War, but certainly tension between, again, East and West uh, in the Ukraine, in, in Crimea. Um, let me ask you a couple of uh, provocative questions. And before we open it up uh, to the general audience, um, People always talk about who actually won the Cold War. Was it Reagan? Was it uh, Bush? Was it Helmut Kohl? Who won it? 
Oh boy, uh, I think I, you can invite me to teach a seminar on that, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the way I teach it to my students is this way. Reagan definitely didn't win it. Meaning I'm not for this American triumphalist notion that Reagan single-handedly pushed the Soviet Union over the brink. I think it was rather a combination of factor where American pressure contributed to events accelerating in the Soviet Union once the reform agenda came out. But I think if you look for the deeper reasons of the collapse of the Soviet Union, it had to do with uh, structural factors such as economic weakness, uh, uh, growing economic weakness in the Soviet Union. I would say the crisis of leadership in the sense that this gerontocracy finally uh, 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 almost brought the country to collapse because they didn't really have a good uh, succession modus. They didn't have election. the elections. They appointed the old guys and the old guys, as I suggested, kept dying. So I think that was a genuine crisis of leadership, which is, I think, a structural factor in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union too. And I think one factor that you don't hear as often discussed, also uh, a sort of inherent in the Eastern Bloc is the dissident movement that developed as a result of the Helsinki Final Act and uh, ask it number three, meaning uh, the human rights agenda that was put front uh, uh, line and center to the fore. And uh, it was that uh, uh, human rights aspect of CSCE that encouraged Charter 77 to form, that encouraged Rolf Biermann to sing about uh, the East German regime and how defunct it was, that it encouraged uh, the dissidents. Now we know in these various countries the dissidents were suppressed. Uh, Havel ended in jail, Biermann was thrown out of the country. But nevertheless, I think, it, uh, if you will, the seed of demanding uh, more freedom uh, was powerfully set in these dissident movements, in the Soviet Union too. And I think that spirit could no longer be suppressed. And we see then a Havel emerging in 1989, I think, which would allow you to make that direct trajectory from Helsinki to what was happening in Prague in 1979. So I think that's a, a, a very important structural factor too. And of course it is then in the GDR in 1989 very much the dissidents uh, uh, that uh, eventually uh, first bring the wall down and then bring the regime down. So, so I would look for structural internal factors in the Soviet Union more than uh, what happened in the United States. But I would not underestimate the importance of the SDI initiative, uh, new arms races and such. Sure, that pushed them through. So the protest movement, the dissidents, play a greater role than Ronald Reagan or George H.W. Bush? In many respects, yes. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask you a brief question about Gorbachev and then we open it up. Uh, you said that Reagan kind of changed tack from the first to the second term, from a cold warrior, you said. Mm -hmm. He became more of a constructive person interested in, in engagement with the Soviet yeah, Union. Yeah. Does that also apply to Gorbachev? Because Gorbachev, when he came to office, he was a traditional communist. He did not want to give up the Soviet Union. He believed into the Communist Party until after the coup uh, against him. And he only very hesitatingly uh, forbid the Communist Party and left the Communist Party. So initially, he was really a traditional communist, though of course younger mm -hmm. than, um, uh, than, than his predecessors. Um, so did Gorbachev also have a, a change of mind or how do, how do we explain his policy which in the end led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union? Yeah, no, that's a good point, but uh, probably he was uh, a man who was also growing on the job. I mean, he clearly came in with uh, the idea of reform and announced that very quickly, but then uh, to pass uh, his reform agenda by the generals and the Soviet right wing, uh, that became sort of his, his big task because there was elements that were dead set against his reform. And I think his role in history, if you will, and of course uh, 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 when you go to Moscow today and talk to Russian people about Gorbachev, they uniformly condemn him. They all think he gave away the candy, candy storm. So we have to keep that in mind too, that we in the West think much more positively about Gorbachev's historical role and achievement of bringing down the Soviet Union than uh, the Russian people would today, and that's part of Putin's appeal. Uh, 
that he very, very much uh, speaks up against uh, figures like Gorbachev and uh, their role in, in, in Russian history. So I think Gorbachev grew on the job and once uh, uh, he had some very gifted advisors too, Yakovlev and Chernayev, Chernayev were, were uh, you know, very, very good advisors and very keen advisors and I think they helped him, if you will, gather that courage to stare down the generals and bring about initiatives like his UN speech and say we're going to pull 500,000 men and 5,000 tanks out of Eastern Europe. I mean, many people say that was really the end of the Brezhnev doctrine. First of all, that announcement, and then second of all, that of course he didn't interfere in the Polish round table. Then it should have been clear, even though to the Bushies for a long time that did not remain clear. And that's sort of what the critics today say. It took them much too long to recognize that the days of the Brezhnev doctrine were over. That it took him much too long with this pause to formulate uh, uh, his foreign policy because he should have been out there encouraging Gorbachev much more than he did given the historical opportunity that opened up in keeping Gorbachev going in his reform agenda and, and Bush didn't do much of that but I'd agree with you Gorbachev grew on the job too and I think he had no idea that within five years he'd be uh, where he started out in 1985. Right, thanks very much. And Putin, of course, was a Cold War spy master in East Germany, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, he was sitting there pretty in Dresden and uh, seeing these <laughs> Indeed. events unfold. Yeah. Can you open it up to questions? Uh, take the gentleman at the back and then at the front. Would you speak in the microphone? Surely. If I understood you correctly, I think you suggested that one of the significant contributing factors to the erosion of the Soviet Union years ago was economic pressures, a stagnating economy. To what degree is that the situation in the Soviet Union now? I've heard commentators Russia. suggest in Russia, Russia thank you, yeah. in Russia now, I've heard commentators suggest that part of Putin's aggressiveness is a way to, is to distract his population from the stresses that they're under economically. Would you comment on that? Yeah, I can, but uh, keep in mind I'm, I'm not really an expert on Russia today. I can give you sort of some impression that I gathered being in Moscow a couple years ago. There my impression and from many conversations I had that is that Moscow region is doing well, you know, and you see the new wealth all over town. You know, you see the dark tinted Mercedeses, the biggest limousines driving around. Uh, uh, but I understand, and since my visa only was good for Moscow, I couldn't leave the town. You know, that's Russia too today. Uh, well, if you, why, I guess. Yeah, if you go out in the countryside, there is just pervasive poverty. Uh, so I think you have a country that is deeply divided, but interestingly enough, it's the people in the countryside that are uh, keeping Putin in office because it is to those people he appeals. Just read the, the very fine piece by David Remnick in The New Yorker. He talks about this, you know. Putin is sort of trying to reinterpret Soviet history. Communism was not so bad. Stalin was not so bad. The bad moment really was Gorbachev in 1989 when we let the, the empire uh, slip. So it is uh, high time, he says, that sort of we regather, not necessarily the empire, but our power and we stare down and he blames everything that's wrong on the West. Of course, he doesn't, he doesn't talk about the olig oligarchs and how you know, the, 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 the difference between rich and poor in the Soviet Union is much bigger in this country. Uh, so it's very hard to really talk about the Soviet economy today other than saying you know, the oil and gas economy is going gangbusters. Uh, and of course, that's what they live on. But just wait, if prices go down ever, you know, they're going to be hurting again. Like one of the big moment of truth for the old leadership in the Soviet Union was when oil prices at roughly 83 went down. And the question still is whether Reagan engineered that. There is some voices who say he engineered the oil prices going down because that really hurt the Soviet Union very much economically. And also that, of course, the entire bloc, the entire Soviet empire, depended on their cheap oil and gas. And we know this is the problem in Ukraine today. 
you know, that uh, the pipelines go through, through Ukraine and uh, they are entirely dependent on, on Soviet uh, uh, gas, Russian, uh, Russian. Uh, Russian, excuse me, Russian <laughs> gas to feed, uh, you know, to, to, to keep their houses warm. And much of their economic crisis has to do with that relationship being so dependent on, 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 on Russia. So I think there, the jury is still out. Thanks very much. Roger Lodgen. Yes, I was happy to hear you say that Bush had very good men around him when he was formulating his policy. Is that true today in the Obama administration? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, of course, as a historian, I would have to say it's too early <laughs> to say. And remember, I said I had to revise my views once I read these NSC files, you know, the, 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 the quality of argument that you read in these files uh, you know, speaks of what I think are very fine minds. Now, if I look at Obama's team, you know, I think Kerry gave a pretty good speech today in, in, in Kiev. Kerry is a very experienced uh, politico when it comes to foreign affairs. Uh, uh, you know, he brings a lot of experience from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So, you know, you'd have to go through individual people and say, they're doing a good job. Now, Susan Rice, you know, I think the jury is still out, uh, not because of Benghazi, but we don't really know what kind of advice she gives to the president. But I would guess this, let me speculate and be bold, that the advice she gives uh, to the president is very similar to the advice that Scowcroft gave to the president. Be very cautious, be very careful, and I think we have seen since Libya that that is Obama's policy vis-a-vis -vis these crises. Because after the experiences uh, with the Iraq war, I think the American public has become very careful about these sudden and quick interventions. And I think the American public at large would say what Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator McCain, you know, the kind of advice give, go in, show your military might, I think that won't work. That is just aggravating the conflict. And I would say, if anything, what I'm trying to say here about Bush in 1989, the very careful diplomacy, the cautiousness, that in the long run turned out to be the right policy. Uh, and, you know, I would, I would today uh, assess Bush's foreign policy. I'm not even talking about Iraq. That's an entirely different business, the first uh, Gulf War. But overall, I would uh, assess it as a very successful foreign policy. You know, with the Obama administration, we might say uh, Obama's second term rung in the end of American empire in the sense that he no longer is uh, intervening on every occasion like it would have been done in a knee-jerk fashion during the Cold War and even during the immediate post-Cold War era. But that might not be a bad thing for the United States. And it may not be a lasting thing either, you don't know. Yeah, but uh, uh, th that's, that's where I see this heading right now. But, you know, it's too early to really say he's got a finer, or a lousy foreign policy team. Uh, uh, you know, I think Hillary Clinton did a good job, and I think Kerry is doing a good job with national security advisors. I just don't know who the staffers are, you know. I think this was a, a unique moment because of these brilliant young staffers. I mean, Condoleezza's uh, advice is written all over the files on Eastern Europe. She appears on just about every document. So, I mean, there you see a quality historian being called into the White House and with uh, that deep insight into Soviet and Eastern European affairs being able to give very sound advice. So a historian in the White House on the NSC team is not a bad thing. <laughs> so that's the recommendation to Obama. I quite agree. Uh, professor, um, speculate, if you will, how things might have turned out or direction might have taken if the warm relationships between Bush and Gorbachev, Reagan and Gorbachev, had not been there. In other words, did these warm relationships make a difference, or is that simply good for photo ops, et cetera? No, I think personal diplomacy matters. That's a very, that's a very good question. I think personal diplomacy matters. And both presidents, it took a long time to develop this warm relationship. And I think that's where symmetry comes in. Well, I have to say, you know, in diplomatic relations, summit meetings at the right time can play a very positive role. 
Uh, so I think I think Bush was very cautious in sort of being uh, 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 being swept up by the Gorbachev agenda too early, and I think that also had to do with the likes of Cheney and Robert Gates and the vice president constantly warning him that uh, uh, Perestroika was a hoax. That this was just a means to let the guard down for the United States uh, and then in the end to come out of this smelling pretty. I mean that's the advice he got from the Republican right wing. And I think that's why he took so long in developing the new policy and then took so long to dare meet him in a summit meeting. But uh, James Baker had met Shevard Nazi already a number of times before that, and they developed an extraordinary close relationship. Sort of like uh, before him, uh, uh, Reagan's Secretary of State uh, uh, had, had a very good relationship with Shevard Nazi. Uh, yeah, George Schultz, yeah. So. Uh, but can I interrupt that? Isn't it also the case that the Europeans, or some of the Europeans, like uh, Britain's Margaret Thatcher and France's uh, François Mitterrand, were more than skeptical about Gorbachev and what developed, and warned Bush not to be uh, driven too quickly into the arms of Gorbachev, so to speak? That's true. Uh, Thatcher probably more than Mitterrand. But Thatcher was sort of much more worried about uh, the Cherbet question. Uh, and her sort of advice, very stern advice to Bush about not going too quickly on Germany than on uh, Gorbachev. In you fact, think it's the modernization of the nuclear weapons. And yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, right, but it was, in fact, uh, I think Thatcher was the first one to meet Gorbachev uh, personally, and then she gave the advice to Reagan that this man was serious, this was a man you could deal with, so in that sense, he encouraged, he encouraged Reagan and then Bush to go ahead and meet uh, Gorbachev. So I think, yes, there was cautious advice there too. I mean, the interesting thing about these telephone calls is that they are full of backbiting. You know, when, when, <laughs> when, when Gorbachev talks to Mitterrand, they, they say a lot of uh, things like, you know, Bush is not so smart. Uh, and then somebody like like uh, uh, Cole comes in and say, uh, or Matlock says, "Oh no, he's he's very smart. He is he is uh, you know uh, Ivy League trained. Uh, he's been around in U.S. government for a long time." So uh, there it gets very confusing if you look at these telephone conversations, because very often they are very candid and and, and 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 sort of cut the other guy down in front of the other thing. So I think you would find evidence for that kind of caution. Uh, but you'd also find evidence for somebody like uh, Cole very much encouraging Bush to go forward and develop this personal friendly relationship. I mean, the Germans definitely were very impressed uh, after the, the visit, I think, in June in Germany by Gorbachev. These, these phone conversations must be good fun if they're so candid. Yeah. Now we know why the NSA likes to listen <laughs> in. They want to have some fun. <laughs> good. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you very much for giving us this uh, primer on the acceleration of history in 1989 and also for showing that it was not the end of history. It didn't ac accelerate to like a definitive end. And you, you, you touched on the, um, you know, like how it informed or continued to inform U.S. foreign policy afterwards. Uh, and I would be interested if you could talk a little more of that. Why is this... Uh, seen and you you have highlighted the restraint of the U.S. foreign policy ti t uh, team at this era. Why is it then frequently cited in the triumphalist no narratives as the big break of American foreign policy uh, for the next 15 years? And especially if you look at the career of Condoleezza Rice, if she was her ten in her tenure as national security. Uh, advisor to the second president Bush, she was not pushing for restraint. How? How does that um, this experience get mis uh, or cast differently, recasted in the later years? That's, that's a, good, a good question, but a tough one. I would say the triumphalists have not been in the archives, so that's why they can come up with these myths about you know the Bush administration. On the other hand, I would say that you know Bush's misfortune was not to be reelected in 1992. Had he been re-elected, probably uh, we would have developed a much more positive uh, uh, interpretation of his foreign policy and not would have had to wait for 25 years. 
so I think, uh, you know, to me it's still amazing that uh, Bush left, uh, lost that election after these extraordinary events uh, uh, in Eastern Europe where he, I think, particularly in German unification, uh, uh, acted as a very mature and circumspect uh, president. And I think given what happened in the first Gulf War, sure you could say now with hindsight he should have taken out Saddam. And again, I think not taking out Saddam uh, in 1991 indicates his extraordinary caution. But after those foreign policy successes not to be re-elected, that's sort of the amazing thing. And, and I think then, of course, a one-term president, it's sort of easy, in spite of the huge agenda that he accomplished, it's easy to dismiss him. So, so I think, I think that, that hurt his image in history, at least immediately thereafter, in the first assessments, quite a bit. Thank you very much. I take this question over there and I would just like to mention that students are also allowed to ask a question. I'll take you next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is sort of a segue from that actually. Um, two weeks ago there was a talk here about uh, the first hundred days after 9-11 and George W. Bush dealing with this. And what struck me was uh, this was a man who had come into office only nine months before. And we have a tendency in this country to elect governors. And here you have a great contrast. So you have someone with great experience. You have a segue from a Republican administration to another administration and sort of speculating on what would have happened had we had an election in which a governor with no Washington experience had been elected during this period. That's a good one. I'm just trying to think, uh, would it be Governor Dukakis? <laughs> yeah, or even Bill Clinton. Uh, I would say, of course, you never know what kind of team they appoint. And what I stress here and what I realized is how important the team is. You know, I think Bush pretty much left matters into his Co his Co Crofts hands, and he directed the policy process, and the Bush often followed him. And of course, it's not, uh, uh, it's quite natural then that they write Bush's memoirs together. I mean, that's, that's quite an interesting book because it's sort of a dialogue between the two of them. It's not one narrative, but two narratives, which is very interesting. But had it been a governor, I would have to say it would have been very hard to react to these events uh, uh, as carefully and cautiously uh, with uh, as much circumspection. Uh, as Bush did because, uh, you know, a governor not having this kind of experience and sense, innate sense of how international politics worked, it have, would have been much more likely that uh, he might have been too critical of Gorbachev and in that sense then stopped the process in the Kremlin. It might have been quite likely that he would have listened to the Polish lobby more and in that sense encouraged uh, uh, Valenza uh, too much, which again could have, uh, and you know, Bush did not know whether the Soviets would intervene. We know they didn't intervene in 1980-81, uh, but uh, the Poles, uh, the Polish military took over the government, you know. But uh, the, the Brezhnev doctrine was very, very much still active in 1981. So, I mean, I would have to think about that long and hard and, you know, would have to think about who this person would have been. But I would have to say today, even though 1988, uh, living in Massachusetts, I was a strong Dukakis supporter, I don't think he could have handled these events as well. And that would have been the likely candidate. So I think it's a good question, but it's hard to speculate too far there. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, recently attended an event with Scowcroft in attendance and Scowcroft admitted quite frankly that it was he who was the cautious voice in the Bush White House, particularly regarding German unification but also some of the other developments in Eastern Europe. That Bush, the president and some other people were quite prepared to give uh, Gorbachev and also Helmut Kohl much more the benefit of the doubt early on, while Scowcroft himself, he said, because of past developments, you know, German history and so on and so on. Uh, he was the, 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 the kind of dampening voice, at least for a few weeks or months. And if he even admits that in public, then he must really have been a voice.
voice which was kind of trying to restrain things. And another thing... I, I can't uh, see yeah. that yet. Well, yeah. I can only say what he said. Of course, people's yeah. memories sometimes, you know. Anyway, I've asked uh, Scowcroft whether he would like to come and join us in uh, Chapel Hill, and he may be coming. Oh. <laughs> but I'm sorry. Um, in terms of the first and second term of Reagan, how was Reagan able to maintain his Cold Warrior reputation and, and public support um, while at the same time looking as it like becoming less... Um, brazen and opening up to uh, Gorbachev more? How was he able to maintain his public support despite his shift well, in mentality? Keep in mind, he was re-elected in November 1984. He had just started this process of begin a dialogue with uh, uh, the Soviet leadership. It was still Chernyenko, but as Reagan himself, you know, said, they sort of keep dying on me in order to start a dialogue. So it didn't really unfold yet in 84. When he was re-elected and when Gorbachev then became Secretary General, that really opened the window of opportunity. And never underestimate you know, the power of an American president not having to think about re-election. I mean, this is sort of where Roger Lodgen's question, you know, could also, how it also could be uh, could be answered. You know, uh, Obama can be much more decisive or could be much more decisive in his foreign policy in the second term than in the first term because he doesn't have to worry about re-election anymore. And I think that's why, uh, that's why Reagan was uh, uh, so forthcoming in developing this relationship with uh, uh, Gorbachev because Foremost, I think, on Reagan's mind was nuclear disarmament. That was sort of, if you will, his uh, baby, his big uh, desire. And, you know, I mean, he, he accomplished a lot in terms of the INF Treaty, of, you know, taking the intermediate range weapons out of Europe. But the big strategic deal that escaped him that he had hoped for in Reykjavik. Uh, the big strategic dream was to do away with uh, the long range uh, nuclear arsenals. And I still can not believe today, when I think about Reykjavik, that that ever could have unfolded. But they were very uh, uh, close to, that, uh, to such a deal, were it not for SDI. It was SDI that then uh, did away with it. So I think, I think you know, if the president no longer has to think about uh, re-election, uh, it's, uh, it, it's easier to be bold and forthcoming and not to think about Republican light wings and, and you know, uh, publics. I think the big issue with Reagan that we need to think about in future scholarship is how much did his uh, physical condition affect him towards the end of the second term? We don't know that yet. If you recall, his son uh, wrote a memoir not too long ago where in fact he thought, you know, that uh, Alzheimer was setting in maybe halfway through his second term. And having studied Kennedy in Vienna very closely and the enormous physical infirmities that Kennedy went with uh, to Vienna. Three doctors, you know, I mean Kennedy was a wreck, you could say, physically <laughs> in many respects. I'm much more interested now to see in what physical shape presidents are when they go into these big meetings. I think that's, that's an important issue to pay attention to. Think about Roosevelt at Yalta. We know today that he was affected by his health. And, 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 and I think we will find out in the future, uh, you know, when once, once we look into the president's uh, 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 medical files, and this is of course what Robert Dalek did with Kennedy in his, in his big biography. Or you know, Weinstein did with Weinstein did with with the Wilson medical files uh, to, you know, get that uh, better sense of the president's physical well-being. Thank you, Gerd Weinberg. Uh, perhaps at at some point you'll comment on uh, Bush's uh, Kiev uh, appearance, which was much discussed at the time. But there was one comment I think you want to think about in terms of your discussion of the internal development of the Soviet Union that leads to the collapse. And that is that only during World War II did the regime really have the mass support of its population. And with the passage of time, 
that simply waned. And its collapse, I would suggest, is in part at least the result of the loss of legitimacy in the eyes of its own population. If in the main cities you had to have foreign currency to buy what you want to, in the eyes <laughs> of the people there, mm -hmm. that was, if you will, whether you're talking about the Soviet Union or East Germany, is a sort of self-denigration of a regime. Imagine what people here in this country would think if they were told that the only way you can buy what you really want is to get rubles or yen or some other foreign currency. Mm -hmm. uh, a country undermined itself at the same time as the legitimacy it acquired in the Second World War by defending them successfully mm -hmm. against an even worse system, that has something to do with it. Thank you. Of course, I knew that Gerhard Weinberg would want me to come back to World War II. <laughs> but no, I, I, I think I don't really have to add uh, much uh, to your question, which is really more a comment that this uh, uh, declining legitimacy, uh, legitimacy of the regime was going on. And, and, and I think particularly in this quick succession of those three leaders I've been talking about, I think that could not have legitimated the, the party very much amongst the Soviet people as the economic situation was worsening too. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget about that. With the Kitchen Chikiev speech, uh, I, I simply have not gone that far ahead. And, and you know, since I didn't really look at any files and uh, you know, there you'd of course want to look at the speech draft and see who wrote the speech. You know, with these speeches that I quoted here, I did look at quite a few of the speech drafts, and very often it was it was it was, it was uh, Condi Rice who was behind the drafts. You know, so I don't think I really can comment on that much. But on you know your second comment, yeah, I agree. That that's an important factor to consider. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for an excellent summary, especially the insights. Thank you, Professor, especially for the uh, insights you gave us with regard to the Bush administration. The uh, uh, you talked about dissidents and mentioned the, the Polish uh, government uh, takeover, I think, and maybe repression of the solidarity movement in early 80s. Uh, what are, what, what's your view on the impact of the solidarity movement, not only within Poland, but within Eastern Europe, and also the influence of Pope John Paul II? Uh, did he really have? any role to play? Yeah, no, the impact of solidarity was immense. I mean, you know, if uh, there is a labor movement uh, under communism which has supposedly taken such good care of the labor class, you know, that in and of itself is quite extraordinary. And then, of course, the courage of these people, the beating they took from the government, how they continued to exist underground throughout the 1980s in spite of martial law, and how that persistence then get them accepted into uh, uh, the round table discussions and eventually into the government. You know, I think that's an extraordinary sequence of events. I think with the Pope, it's sort of the same thing as with the triumphalists. You know, he opens his files very late, uh, uh, and uh, we simply don't know enough yet about his role. We know it was, was important in Poland because of the standing he had in Polish society. We also know that uh, Reagan's CIA chief, who was a fervent Catholic himself, was frequently uh, 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 with the Pope in, in Rome. So I think there was definitely encouragement of the Pope's role of going to Poland, you know, of playing, uh, giving those extraordinary sermons in Poland, I think in his 82 visit. You know, I'm not saying that CIA was behind it, but. Uh, 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 the CIA chief, I'm trying to think of his name, Bill, Bill, Colby. Colby. No, it was, no, it was not Colby. Who is who? The, the big Reagan uh, CIA chief, I should know his name, come, come to me in a moment. Yeah, no. Anyway, uh, he, he had a very uh, uh, solid 
relationship with the Pope. I mean, the, the CIA's role in these events of 1989 is actually very interesting in the sense that the CIA files that I read is uh, that they very much were sitting on the fence. But of course, uh, uh, that CIA chief was gone. Uh, uh, Gates was no longer in the CIA. Uh, so the CIA did not really play much of a role in you know, encouraging or discouraging Bush's policy because the advice sort of was, was very ambiguous. So amongst the many voices which you have to interpret if you look at a president's foreign policy, the CIA did not play such a big role. But I think it played a much bigger role in the Reagan administration and particularly with regard to relations with, with, with the Pope. So I think it's an important factor to keep in mind, but you know, like probably Catholic triumphalists would say the Pope brought down, uh, uh, brought down uh, the communist regime. You know, I think that's nonsense, of course. We know as careful historians that there is many factors involved, there's much contingency involved, and that's really what you have to assess. Thank you very much. Mike Morgan. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned Tiananmen Square earlier, so I'd like to ask you about China. Uh, the last 25 years have been much kinder to Beijing than they have to Moscow. Um, why didn't the Soviet Union follow China's path? Because it's a very tough question too, because Gorbachev had already been uh, as a head of the Kremlin uh, carefully unfolding his reform agenda, which uh, I think many in the Kremlin leadership came to realize was needed given the growing economic crisis. Uh, and also the growing economic crises in the bloc. I mean, if you read Charlie Mayer's book, Dissolution, you know, he has a very powerful chapter on the economic decline of the bloc and, you know, the relationship between Moscow and, 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 and the bloc. So, uh, by 1989, certainly Gorbachev didn't have the will to roll down the Polish uh, reform process. And by 1990 in the Soviet Union, it would have been too late. Uh, there was generals, I think, uh, who were, would have been inclined much earlier to stop Gorbachev's reform and do whatever was needed, unleash the violence that was needed in order to stop it. But, but I think with this accelerated pace of history in 1989, it was too late to use that kind of force, bloody force. Uh, you know, I've studied quite carefully the Warsaw Pact invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. That's really the last time when the Brezhnev Doctrine was being applied big time. And it was a pretty violent action, but it was not a bloody mess like Tiananmen Square. Yes, people got hurt, people got killed, but it was not a big black bath, blood bath. I think more people got killed in Bucharest when Ceausescu was brought down than in Prague in 19, 1968. Uh, but that extraordinary violence, it was too late to apply in 1989. I think that the question would be interesting, why did Yanukovych not have the will uh, and the grit to apply it recently on Maidan Square, I think he tried, but then he stopped in his tracks because, you know, I think he was afraid of the outcome. Thank okay. you. Yeah. And there were, of course, concerns that uh, violence would be used in East Germany, and it wasn't because of the political leadership, but because of the milit or the unreliability of the police forces and the military, why it wasn't used, is that correct? Well, in East Germany, Honecker wanted to use force. And I think the Stasi was of prepped to do it for him in Leipzig, uh, say, you know, in the first uh, uh, rounds of the protests in late September, early October. Uh, Charlie Mayer is quite good on this, too. And uh, then uh, I think uh, Gorbachev doesn't, didn't lose his will, but the rest of the leadership did. Uh, now, the voices uh, that then, you know, told Gar uh, Honecker, you can't do this, and fired him there was the men who came to power afterwards. But, but I think that was a decision made inside the Politburo not to do it. Because uh, I think they were, they were afraid of their own courage there, too. I mean, after all, you know, you kill your own people if you unfold that violence. And I think that's often, that's often you know, even at the forefront of the mind of bloody dic uh, dictators. 
Okay, thanks very much. We have got time for a few more questions, and let me encourage uh, students again to ask the odd question or so. But first, DJ Martin. <laughs> You're not a student, I know. No, 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 I claim to be a student. I claim to be a student. It's really hard for me to ask this question without uh, people thinking that I'm a Putin uh, admirer. Are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm very skeptical about it, but I wonder if the Cold War... Uh, the reassertion of the Cold War and the experiences of the Cold War have handicapped us in evaluating uh, the, the situation in Europe today and the, it, it, at least in my mind, the mandatory objective of having a sustainable, careful um, uh, situation in Europe which is sustainable and which is uh, also pays appropriate attention to what, what you might say are the realities with respect to the experience in Ukraine and Russia. And th so the bottom line is, um, it, would, would the uh, careful students who ran the Bush, the first Bush administration, uh, be in a position to advise us today a little bit more about the uh, underst getting in the shoes of and trying to understand the uh, legitimate aspirations of those who we are in opposition to? Again, I, I don't know who the NSC people are that would advise, uh, uh, you know, the NSC advisor first and foremost about... You're the historian who should be there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, but see, I'm not a historian of Eastern Europe. I'm, I'm trying to figure out the American government. So these questions I very much appreciate, but, but sometimes, you know, and I don't want to say, well, not my expertise. You know, I have my thoughts about these things too, but... You know, not knowing uh, who advises the NSC advisors on Eastern Europe, I'm, I'm not sure whether he is getting the careful advice. But my, my assumption is they have good people in there too. But who they are, I don't know. And, and of course, the judgment could only be made once you, you sort of see the kind of memos they write. And we have to wait for 25 years to, to read those memos, unless they do what the Sally Cohen Rice did and publish a book uh, as soon as they're out of the White House, which of course is great for the contemporary historian, particularly if it's that quality book. But it's a very rare case in history. It doesn't happen very often. So, so I think there I'd have to pass. I simply don't know enough about his team to, to, I mean, judging from what I said today, yeah, if he has a good team around him, the president in the NSC, he should be able to deal with these events as difficult as they are. But my hunch is he's going to do the same thing he did in Libya and Syria and stay out of it as much as he can. Because that's, I think, the lesson he learned from Iraq. You know, it's easy to intervene quickly, but it's very hard to withdraw. I mean, look at the difficulties he has in Afghanistan where he wants to withdraw, you know, dealing with uh, the current government there. Thank you. But let's hope that these NSC advisors are historians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> And this you know, Richard Pipes was a historian. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> right, right. Well, there are some exceptions to the rule. Yes, let me pass it on. Here was a question. Yeah, you had a question? Just out of curiosity, and do you think that if, if the same people were uh, um, advising this president, that he would have a different attitude? And, and also, if, they were, if he can continues this... Uh, drawing lines and consequences and this kind of thing. Is that leading other people to take more advantage of it or are they being more wary of going in against us? I don't think uh, Obama's uh, caution in these events like in Syria and, and Ukraine is encouraging anybody to come in and upstage the United States because everybody realizes you know, this is a big country if, if this country collapses and is divided up, uh, you know, uh, it, it can lead to all kinds of consequences in the region. But, you know, we should not be surprised that uh, Putin intervened in uh, uh, the Crimea because he intervened in Georgia a few years ago. You know, uh, right when we did uh, our, came out with our book on, on Prague Spring of 68 and the intervention, I sort of looked at what was happening in Georgia, and it was interesting. It was an election year uh, at that time, and, and NATO was unwilling to intervene. They expected the United States to intervene. So that's sort of the issue, too. Should NATO be doing more here? You know, Clinton would have said, 
as he said early on in the Yugoslav crisis, this is something for the Europeans to resolve. And I think Angela Merkel and the Germans are showing more interest in getting involved in the diplomatic process of uh, resolving these issues. So this in a way comes back to your question too. So I would not be surprised if the Obama administration puts a lot of pressure on its European allies to play a bigger role in trying to resolve this issue rather than the US doing it. So I think that that's where I say we are in the phase post-American hyperpower where the US thought it could resolve all the conflicts of the world. More China in that kind of thing. Well, how do you mean with China? China, they seem to be trying to get some territory, uh, the Japanese islands and then... Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but you know he's he's not doing very much there either. I think even though he did the Pacific pivot, he doesn't seem to be more inclined to intervene there and and, and hold the, the Chinese back. You know, I mean, after the extraordinary report we got from the UN about the bloody regime in North Korea, you should have to ask: Shouldn't the world community, including the US, do much more to bring that regime down? You know, uh, not all of these conflicts are America's conflicts anymore. I think that's, that's sort of the post-Cold War attitude that the administration is being implementing here. I think when we are thinking back in 10 or 20 years, we, we might see a turning point here, as I suggested, you know, away from American empire, quote, unquote. I, I'm not sure whether Michael Hunt is here. He probably could say much more on whether this is the end of American ascendancy. <laughs> I don't know him. It's a very fine book, but you know, he would be somebody who would have a lot to say on this. Thank, Thank you. you. One final question here. Mm -hmm. um, I am an historian of East Central Europe, and that may make me reckless for that matter. And I'm the honorary consul for Poland, so I appreciate your notes on uh, the Polish contribution in the early 1980s. Uh, I'd like to observe that the early 1980s, the early to the mid-1980s, are a very peculiar moment in time. You mentioned the geriatric character of the Soviet regime. In addition to that, I would posit that uh, every dictatorial system hits a crisis in the succession, which again, you mentioned. The handling of a succession is extremely difficult in a very centralized regime. And then, finally, I would like to emphasize another structural question, and that is technological development. That the PC comes into its own about 1981, at exactly the moment that we are seeing the events in Poland. And this individualistic, this extremely individualistic development, which both feeds the individualism and feeds off the individualism, uh, the Soviet Union was very ill-equipped culturally and politically to, uh, to make. So it was left behind very rapidly in the early years of the 1980s, and this had its effect in economic and defense terms. SDI, you mentioned all of those things. Well, SDI is usually the, the item mentioned where the Soviets realized they couldn't keep up with this if the Americans really were capable of doing it, but today we know the Americans it took the Americans a long time to develop that uh, sort of missile defense capability. They are still working on it. Right. And I would posit one more thing uh, with uh, Professor Weinberg as well. It was a crisis of confidence perhaps in the society, but I would say in the late 1980s, there was a crisis of confidence in the Soviet leadership itself. So that when push came to shove, they no longer felt capable of shoving. Well, I don't Thank think Gorbachev had so much uh, a crisis of confidence, but many, you know, the people who were around him who thought he was, he was going too quickly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Günther. That was an excellent performance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your excellent questions. You did a great job, both as far as your talk was concerned and, of course, of leading the discussion and answering so well. And one major conclusion, I must say, is we need more historians in the White House. <laughs> Definitely, you know. But before you all leave, um, I would like to announce that on the 27th of March, we have Ambassador Thomas Pickering here in the Mandela Auditorium, as you may know. Pickering, uh, Thomas Pickering is one of America's most distinguished uh, ambassadors and diplomats. He was ambassador to the Russian Federation, to India, to Georgia, to Nicaragua, to El Salvador, and one or two more countries, uh, to the United Nations, actually. So uh, please do, enjoy, uh, do join us on the 27th of March. And only a few days later, 
the, uh, on the 1st of April, the former British ambassador, Sir Christopher Mayer, the former British ambassador to the United States, who was uh, ambassador during the Iraq war, who had to deal with George W. Bush uh, in D.C., he will come and join us on the 1st of April again in the Mandela Auditorium, both times at 5.30 p.m. And of course, he is a very distinguished diplomat himself. And in the meantime, since retiring from the Foreign Office, he has actually become a bit of a BBC television star, as he has done various documentaries uh, broadcast by the BBC, which were actually quite popular. And both Pickering and Mayer are excellent speakers. They will have something to say about foreign policy and international relations in the contemporary world. And you're all most welcome to join us. And after both talks, there will be a reception as well. So please come and join us. And thank you again, Gunther Bischoff, for your splendid talk today.